Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. Welcome to another episode of the Intermediate Series. The Golden White Lip Python, Leo Python Albertici. This video will also discuss uh, Leo Python Fred Parker I, whose captive husbandry is identical. So, first off, we are back. Thanks chiefly to the success. You're strangling me, dude. Thank you. What do you have to hold on that tight? Well, this is great, isn't it? Anytime you're ready. Bro, settle down. Come on. This is going to be a long video, isn't it? Look what you've done to my hair. Oh, my God. Don't work with animals and children. That's what they say. So, first off, we're back. Thanks chiefly to the success of the YouTube channel uh, we, and having made some serious personnel changes at Snakes and Adders, uh, we have been so busy that making videos has proven just to be an impossibility. This is something I'm thankful for, but equally frustrated by, as I enjoy making these videos, but something had to give. Uh, when these examples of Leo Python came in, I knew I had to use them as the comeback video. Uh, they're one of my favourite species of all time. Uh, and it's probably obvious to see why. A uh, little bit house cleaning first. Um, the personnel changes, we've had two wonderful women join me at Snakes and Adders, Pixie and Becky, who have proven to be worth their weight in gold. And what they make up for in lack of experience, they give in time, passion, commitment and customer service. They have been an absolute revelation to the way that the shop works. And I thank them with all my heart for making the shop the success it's been over the past six months. Uh, now they're both comfortable enough where I can start to take a back seat and start to re start making notes and doing the research for videos uh, so that we can uh, finally get back on track. This is a channel I'm committed to continue working with. So watch this space. We ain't going anywhere. And to all our haters, suck it. Wilet pythons have long been one of my favourite all-time species. I share this affection with a great many other keepers. This is a mid-sized python that has had a seriously confused taxonomic history of late. Come here, monster. Oh, it's holding on tight again. Come on, dude, 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 dude. Thank you. It's too hot and sweaty for this business. Too hot and sweaty. Had a seriously um, confused taxonomic history of late. And this is stifled supply and meant no meaningful analysis by CITES and other bodies can be undertaken to assess risk to the indigenous populations. This lack of supply has made, as always, uh, the much sought after and prices for the species have been rising exponentially. Until new proposed simplifications to taxonomy are widely undertaken, this will only continue to be the case. Often what science is up to, and what the hobby, herpetoculture, what we all do, understands are two different things. Principally, we recognise two types of white lip python. The northern, golden white lip python, and the southern, black white lip python. Their taxonomy we'll get to later, but now accept that there are gold and black specimens. The more commonly encountered species is the golden white lip python, which we have an example of here, and the golden specimens occur across the northern half of Papua New Guinea and Irian Jaya, across this section here, up into the Birdhead Peninsula. Oh, I've lost my plate. I just, you can tell how long it's been. See, so you can laugh, it's fine. And they occur across in the, they occur in the shooting islands, which involves Bayak, and over into the what they call the Vogelkop Peninsula, where they live sympatric with the black population. The most obvious differentiation for us in the hobby, as you have guessed it, is colour. Next is size. Black white lip pythons are larger. The upper accepted limit for golden white lip pythons is 2.5 metres. Although I've never seen a golden white lip approach this size, uh, with a heavy set female around 1.8 meters or 6 feet being the biggest encountered. Although admittedly, I've not seen hundreds of these animals, and probably only a few dozen, maybe 36, 48. Uh, 
and most of them have been imported youngsters or juveniles as is the way uh, in herpetoculture. Black white lip pythons can exceed 2.5 meters and approach 3 meters in length. Again, I've never witnessed spe specimens of this size. My experience with black white lip pythons, thank you, come back here. I mean, really, she's as good as gold for all her reputation. She is, you just, you want to be everywhere, don't you, darling? You want to be everywhere. Look at you. Aren't you fabulous? Oh, where am I? So, yeah, my experience with black white lip pythons um, is limited to around six specimens over the years. And they always came in as sub adult animals, and all of them were male. So, you can imagine the language that came out of my mouth. The largest examples of the blacks that I had were six feet in length, 1.8 meters. These specimens, though, have far larger heads than the golden white lips I've encountered. And the golden white lip pythons tend to have a much more white speckling to the head. And one of the differentials used in science is the presence of white speckling to the post ocular behind the eye scales. And we've got a photographic example of that here. So, this is the southern uh, black. White lip python, uh, Leo python for a Parker eye, illustrated underneath the map. And this is the northern race, the golden white lip python, Leo python albatisi. On the head photograph of the black white lip that we had years ago at Snakes and Adders, you can see that the postocular scales are patternless, whereas on the golden white lip python, two postocular scale white patches exist. This seems to be a true rule for the northern golden race and all of the southern black race and seems to be one of the major differentials used to science to be able to identify them. Um, captive husbandry is a tale of two halves. Neonatal care can be more demanding with animals presenting as weak or finicky and liable to being less being sensitive to less than perfect regulated conditions. A lot of this centers around humidity and their ability to succumb to respiratory infections as neonates. Tales of old, in, um, of old included some keepers even raising neonates for the first few months in almost in incubator-esque conditions to maintain both temperature and high humidity. While most, wh most white lip pythons will begin feeding without too much drama, but on occasion the use of both bird and lizard scenting can be beneficial, as well as the use of live baby mice to in entice initial feeding. What we also can use is something called a reflex feeding technique, which plenty of people who keep intermediate and advanced species will know about, where we get them to strike and bite. This is a reflex, and they drop it. And we have to exercise inordinate amounts of patience to get them to seize it and properly keep hold of it. At which point, we've got to play a game of statues and stand still until they've finished. So you can imagine this is quite a time-consuming project with a litter full of babies um, but nonetheless it's something we've got to do green tree pythons are very similar matlocks pythons are very similar and it's just having the patience to sit with that reflex they're more than willing to strike the uh, the babies are little psychopaths so they're quite willing to lunge it's just getting them to keep hold of that prey out and when they get it unfortunately they see our heat signature and usually strike straight over the cool mouse for us so heating up the prey is important as well as discussed with the initial cosseted care in the incubator, shedding can be problematic in anything less than ideal conditions. The skin is wafer thin when shed and is taut easily, so stuck sheds being quite common. A saturated yet clean tank is a prerequisite to keep the species shedding properly. As the babies develop and enter their second six months of life, things become, begin to ease up and the neonates seemingly harden off. As the babies develop and enter their second six months of life, things begin to ease up and this is a species that grows quickly and they seemingly harden up. Oh, God, you're making me repeat myself. Why are you holding on to time? Oh. Oh. I'll read that whole paragraph again. I'll read that whole paragraph again. So with the babies, as discussed with their initial cosseted care, shedding can be problematic in anything but less than ideal conditions. The skin is wafer thin and when shed and is taut easily, leading to stuck sheds and being, uh, being quite common. A saturated yet clean tank is a prerequisite to keep the species shedding properly. 
as this baby is developing into their second six months of life, things begin to ease up. And this is a species that grows quickly. So they harden off from this point onwards. The next uh, is a unique practice of the golden white lip python and the black lip white lip python. Are you trying to break my pictures? That's not cool. Uh, the, you, with other species you will have not seen up until this point. Once we start offering furred prey to the specimen, white lip pythons will regurgitate fur balls. This is unique to white lip pythons and can be most confusing for a keeper not expecting it. During standard maintenance in the vivaria or tub, compacted ovoid pellets of fur will be found in the tank as well as standard faecal and urate deposits. This is a process known as casting and it, the thought is that it aids their di digestive efficiency and funnily enough when I retrieved her from the tank this morning look what I found. So that is a cast fur ball. She's digested all the goodness, the bone and everything else, collected the fur and hocked a loogie and that's now set as a relatively soft pretty much dry fur ball. Really interesting. And unique to these, so this just, that just makes them even more cool. Initial care, owing to the need of high humidity, regulates to the animal to be raised in a tub system with limited airflow to maintain humidity. This, though, increases the risk of bacterial and fungal issues. So cleanliness is next to godliness when raising white lip pythons. Once the animal is around 24 to 30 inches in length, 60 to 75 centimetres, a transition to a vivarium is possible. The vivarium should be of terrestrial aspect, but with enough height to allow low level climbing. A moss box should always be provided to aid the shedding process, as well as a water bowl that allows the animals to bathe should they want. Whilst their sensitivity to low humidity may not affect them in a respiratory context, bad sheds are still commonplace into adulthood. Substrate should also be deep, as this is also a semi fossorial species that hides underneath leaf litter and moss mats in the wild. Owing to this iridescence and skin condition, it wouldn't be much good being arboreal when you glow all the colours of the rainbow as bright as you can imagine. Heating the vivarium uh, would be by way of halogen bulb, ceramic heat emitter or both coupled to a reliable thermostatic controller. The need for warm air is a must, so this renders the use of deep heat projectors you're now wrecking my cricket tub, don't you? I can hear the rattle. Come. Bear with me. Mrs. Woman, come on. Oh, thank you. This way. Round the front. Oh, my God. It's a good job you're taming it, eh? Are you holding onto my arm? Okay, you can hold onto my arm. Oh, where am I? The need for warm air is a must, so this renders the deep heat projectors ineffective. A basking site area of 32 to 33 degrees Celsius should be provided with a cool end of 26 Celsius during the day. A modest nighttime drop to 28 degrees Celsius at the basking site would be provided, thus allowing the cool end to decay to between 22 and 24 degrees Celsius. In the past, we know snake keepers have not provided UVB. Owing to the wafer-thin skin and the forest biome from which they occur, only low-level UVB should be provided, offering a maximum UV index of 1 at the basking site, and they should be able to retire away from this as they desire. Substrate choices would include orchid bark core, Irish peat moss, cocoa husk, or mixes thereof, to create that rainforest floor type biome we're going for. And whilst this can be sprayed to bolster humidity, level... Low, bolster humidity levels sorry a dedicated moss box must be provided within the air uh, for, with, within which the air will remain saturated therefore to aid humidity retention the access hole for the snake should be in one of the side faces and not the lid of the moss box this allows the air to condensate and drop back into the moss to repeat the cycle cleanliness remains next to godliness uh, and a high priority into adulthood with humid hides of this nature so as to avoid fungal and bacterial issues. Golden white lip pythons, as a generalism, are defensive by nature. Babies are highly volatile and will bite vigorously to defend themselves. Threat posing is commonplace and simply your presence may be enough to get them striking before you have made any attempt to even approach them. Some animals will retain this distrust uh, in humans into adulthood, whilst others can become surprisingly tame once removed from the vivaria. 
surprisingly tame. I mean, she's glorious, absolutely glorious. Cage defensive behaviour, though, is commonplace, even with her. She tries to dart away, and she's not happy when you enter a viv, but once she's removed, she's good as gold. Um, and even, uh, sorry, cage defensive behaviour is commonplace, even with animals that present as hand tame once out. When dealing with irritable specimens, ensure that the decor of the tank does not get in the way uh, to avoid damage that can occur to teeth and snout by lashing out and bashing apparatus. Animals of this nature should not be kept in high traffic areas. Obviously, a severe snout damage can occur from consistent defensive behaviours, leading to stomatitis and secondary respiratory infections. From my limited experience of six or so specimens of black wily pythons, I found without exception that this is the tamer species. I could, it could have just been luck of the draw, of course, but I have never been bitten or even threatened to be bitten by a black whitelip. Golden white lip pythons are egg layers, with the mother entering into maternal incubation behaviours. Uh, given the chance, artificial incubation temperatures uh, should be 32 Celsius, with a vermiculite to water ratio mix of three parts vermiculite to one part water by volume. Hatching will occur in 60 or so days, and egg yields of 6 to 12 eggs are the norm. Mentioned previously, the taxonomic, taxonomy of this species is confused to say the least. Relatively recent papers uh, released proposed in varying regularity the expansion of the genus to include Leopython albatisi, this, Leopython biacensis, Leopython meridionalis, Leopython fred parkeri, Leopython hoseri, Leopython montanus, and Leopython huonensis. The chief problem paper being by Schlepp in 2008. Daniel Natush and team sought to check the DNA of the proposed subspecies and relegated some into non-existence and others to be synonymized within the two accepted clades that they found by uh, the supporting evidence for in DNA. First, forget Hoserai. It was named by a douchebag. Do some research on Raymond Hoser. The guy's a joke. Anytime you see Hoserai mentioned in the scientific name, disregard it. Biacensis and Huonensis were made synonyms of Leopython albatisi, the northern golden race. So through here, this is Biac on the shooting islands, that's Yappen beneath it. So Biacensis was made synonymous with the golden race that runs across here and the top of the Vogelkot Peninsula, which in English means Birdhead Peninsula. Meridionalis and Montanus were made synonyms of Fred Parkeri. So the accepted southern range right from Ports Moresby down in the south, right through Merauke, all the way up to Timica, and then into the southern part of the Vogelkot Peninsula. That is all now Leopython Fred Parkeri. For a long time, um, the taxonomy I thought I knew had the black uh, or southern white lip python as Leopython meridionalis. Natush argues that priority must be given to Fred Parkeri as it was used first. So they have it has priority. I don't understand the way these rules work with taxonomy and all the rest of it, so but that's what I read, so that's why I'm I'm repeating here. In fact, in total transparency, I still had this species in my head in the genus Bothrachillus, which is a monotopic genus containing the Bismarck ringed python. Uh, and in fact, the label I put on my Viv last week uh, is Bothrachillus albatisi, not Leopython. Uh, and this was based on a paper accepted when published by Reynolds in 2014. To my understanding, every paper since, five or six I believe, places them back into Leopython. So we can fairly safely assume that Leopython is their home for the foreseeable future. Um, Golden White with Pythons have had quite the t Where are you getting? No, 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 no. Golden white lip pythons have had quite the taxonomic history and have been placed in a number of genera over the years. First described in 1878, so 143 years old to science, by Peters and Doria as Liasis albertisi. The name is given in honour to Luigi Maria di Albertis, an, Al an Italian explorer. Subsequently, they've been placed in Leopython, Morelia, and Bothrachillus. For a while, they were even considered a subspecies of the brown water python Liasis fuscus, and they were named Liasis fuscus albatisi. These changes are relatively new, 
with respected websites still using the Schlepp information. In fact, to make things more confused, the ICUN have raised the status of threat to two proposed Schlepp subspecies, even though they've now been disproven. Natush claims the taxonomic analysis of this species to be a cautionary tale of expansion based upon sparse data and morphology only. So finally, we'll look at the climate data for where the species occur, and we'll just round a few things off. Let me just get you from round my neck. Now I don't need my notes, and I can hold you in front of me. I apologise for the stop-start nature of my reading the monologue, simply because somebody wanted to use me as a climbing frame. Call you something else. Have a look at that mush. Isn't she gorgeous? Absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, let's, let's go through all of this and have a recap. This is your daytime high for the golden white lip python and your nighttime low for the golden white lip python. This all looks very exaggerated. We use three regions to be able to take the data. I will come to the data in a moment because there's plenty of people who have an opinion about that. So we'll cover that as well. Um, we took Port Moresby, which is down here. We took Jayapura which is there and we took Manakwari which is there so we've tried to get a spread across the entirety of the island and whilst this looks volatile for the macro data in actually these are 0.5 degree increments so that spike there is 1 celsius so to make it easier to understand I, I took them created the averages the red bar is your daytime high the orange bar is your nighttime low. As you can see, throughout a 12 month period, it's relatively linear. If we had to really stretch for something to say about it, your cool period is here, which is from June to September, where we drop maybe 1.5 Celsius. Uh, the rainfall seems to be a bit more of an indicator. So the macro data from the three regions shown here with the three separate colors again i've taken the averages and then plotted out the annual rainfall and we can see that the dry period for the year also falls between june and september so make of that what you will this here is um, a table taken from the reproductive husbandry of pythons and boas by ross and marsec still considered by many the bible of boa and python breeding and this listed the, obvious, uh, the copulation, um, the laying, and the hatching. So copulation occurs December through Feb, egg laying March through June, and hatching through late April to early August. And that roughly ties in with what would be post dry period entering the wet season. So by lucky happenstance, it all seems to tie together. Generally speaking, you can have pretty linear temperature values. Um, you may drop your nighttime low slightly using standardized bowed practices where you give them a longer, cooler night. Um, but you don't really need to change photo cycle because this animal is equatorial. The equator literally dissects the island. So at which point it's a 12-12 cycle. It's only when we start moving up towards the tropics that you start to see that differentiation between daytime values and nighttime values. Um, honest to God, it doesn't get much better than this. It really doesn't get much better than this. Whilst everybody's chasing morphs, chasing colour phases, chasing everything else, sometimes nature just gets it right. And with white lips, they got it right if you buy yourself a baby white lip you're in for a rough ride it's going to kick your ass for six months and it's just to be expected you're going to treat that baby with kid gloves you're going to keep it in a saturated box at 32 degrees all the time you're going to keep it as clean as a whistle and not let any fungal or bacterial issues take place to make sure that we avoid these respiratory issues honestly the babies are inordinately sensitive to low humidity so take that seriously once we reach this size they're cool worthy of note 
when I was reading the notes, I also looked at Pythons of the World Volume 1 Australia, Dave and Tracy Barker's book. Um, now, they, they were talking about animals that occurred in the Torres Strait, and that's why it was included. But as always, Dave and Tracy's notes are exceptional and pretty much the industry standard, the gold standard for the way that animals should be written up. Uh, and they note that sexual activity is delayed compared to sexual maturity. So an animal can present as of sexually mature size, but not be sexually active for a good few more years after that. So it's relatively common for females of six or eight years to become sexually active. It is very odd for animals at three or four years, which is often the norm for many other pythons, to become sexually active. So this will be a long-term project for you should you take on a white lip python. Well, four months, rusty as hell, three attempts at starting the video, having a snake that was determined to strangle me, put me off my notes. I know it's not as good as the previous ones have been. Um, I'm going to get back in the swing of things. It's just a bit of ring rust and I'll get fighting fit when it comes to doing these videos soon enough. We appreciate your time watching these videos. We appreciate the support you give us, the comments, likes and shares. It means the world to me. And, um, you know, we, we've got a lot more videos planned. I've already started printing out the data for the next video, which will be the rhinoceros rat snake. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll see you soon. Love and peace. Cheers, guys.